Welcome, welcome back, my panda pals, to another episode recapping The Single Life. We are on season four, episode 10, and let's just get right into it. So you know what that means. Sit down, buckle up, and let's all go for a ride. Let's start this off with the neglected and dejected Chantel. Last episode, Giannis invited Chantel to a snail festival where she just kept scowling and pouting and saying things like, ugh, snails are so gross. After she dissed his culture, Chantel went from baddie to saddie when Giannis started paying more attention to his phone than to her. It's a new day and the divorce squad are out getting some food and they reflect on the festival the night before. I ate the smallest piece of snail, but you took it like a champ. I actually spit mine out. It was nasty. Chantel tells us that she is super confused because all of the affection she was getting dried up instantaneously and she has no idea why. I'm confused. All the affection that I was having before from him has disappeared and I just don't understand why. Like, what did I do? Mm, why don't we play the tapes back and look at what you just said? I actually spit mine out. It was nasty. It was nasty. It was nasty. Going to a snail festival and constantly complaining about how snails are gross is the equivalent of going to a baby shower and constantly talking about how children suck and you hate them and they are just tiny little beasts of burden. Know your audience. Read the room. Are you starting to realize you don't want a woman that's been divorced? Are you starting to realize like you don't want an American or is it like, you know, is there something I've done to change your mind about me? Girl, he took you to a snail festival and you did not stop complaining uh, the whole time. It is not because you're divorced. It's not because you're American. It's because you are you. Mooney asks how Chantel is feeling. He kissed me on the cheek instead of on the mouth. The beach was hot and steamy. So then I was like, what happened? Like, I, I just wasn't feeling it. Chantel continues to moan and groan about how Giannis didn't pay any attention to her. And her friends say maybe he isn't giving all of his affection to her because he must be insecure and doesn't know if she even likes him. So like, maybe if he doesn't want to put everything into you because he feels like, does she even really like me? Girl, he knows. The signs Chantel has been giving him, they are big, they are neon, they are covered in glitter. He knows. They encourage Chantel to just be open and communicate and Chantel basically says, oh, it's hard to communicate though. Sometimes I just expect them to know. Her friends tell her that she is way too focused on the future and what could be instead of being present and enjoying the here and now. I absolutely agree with this. I think Chantel is way too future focused that she makes decisions now that she thinks will get her to her goal faster, except she doesn't realize that the decisions that she's made aren't actually serving her goal. I can't control what a person does to me, how a person treats me. All I can do is accept it or walk away from it. Chantel tells the group that Giannis actually did reach out to her in the morning and told her that he wanted to meet up with her one last time before she flew back to the States and she doesn't know what to do. I don't know if I should go. What do you think? Why not? What else we gotta do? Right. I mean, I feel like you should just leave and enjoy the rest of your time in Greece with your friends. Like, I understand that there isn't a lot of drama in that. You would just have a great time. And I think that's what you should do, but what do I know? Well, that means it's another day for glam. Another day. Ooh, you know, maybe you should lay off the glam for today, guys, because it has historically not been to her benefit. I cannot allow what Giannis has on his mind affect me and my happiness. Chantel thinks that the best way to not let Giannis's opinion affect her happiness is to reach out to Giannis to figure out what his opinion on her is. Considering it's Chantel, it tracks. Next, let's head over to Las Vegas to meet up with John. Last episode, Pat and Thais continued to put John down, saying that they do not believe that he has what it takes to grow up and be a better person. John decides to risk it for the biscuit and tells Megan that he is headed down to Texas to live with her. It's a new day and John is packing up his belongings in preparation for his move to Texas. He's apprehensive as hell, but ready to make this huge step for Megan. I mean, what scares me with making this change is just, you know, you're putting everything out there, right? And you're opening yourself up and you just don't want to get hurt. I gotta wonder how committed he is to the move because when he drives off, his car is pretty much empty. 
I mean, granted, nothing in that house probably really belongs to him other than his clothes, so maybe he doesn't really have many belongings to his name. I don't know, I, you, the car just seemed very empty for moving your life permanently. After a long 19 hours of driving, he arrives and Megan is happy he's here? It's definitely a big surprise because I guess I really didn't think that he was going to make the move, but he's here, his car's full, he's, he really did it. John gives River and Megan some gifts. Uh, oh. Instead of flowers, I figured I'd get you cheesecake. <laughs> oh, man, after my own heart, I would definitely prefer cheesecake over flowers. Oh my God. I am telling my partner, I never want flowers now. I just want cheesecake. Megan and River sleep together, so they settle into bed in the main bedroom and John goes to sleep in the second bedroom. He gets into bed in the clothes he was wearing all day. Oh my God, I could never. It is bad enough that you did not wash up before going into bed, but at the barest of minimums, can you please put on some fresh clothes? It is the next day and Josh and Megan hang out in the backyard. So did you sleep good? Meh, slept alone, so it wasn't the best. John tells us that obviously no one wants to drive 19 hours just to go to bed alone. And he tells us that he was definitely pitching a tent that could withstand a category five hurricane. John goes on to reassure her that it is all right because people can do the hanky panky anywhere, like in the laundry room. He tells her that obviously hoinky boinky time is important in the relationship. So don't worry, they can just get it in whenever, wherever. I am really happy that he's here, but John thinks that I'm gonna be having sex with him in the laundry room while my daughter is like having lunch. Like that's definitely not gonna happen. Girl, don't tell us that. Tell him. He's the one that needs his expectations reset. Megan goes on to tell him that she's happy he's here and she does not want to sound ungrateful because she's so far from being an unappreciative person. I'm a very easy to please person, but almost going to be a year. I would hope that you were wanting some kind of commitment as far as like a ring or something. Girl, that is not the definition of being easy to please. I mean, I guess you're easy to please in the sense that whenever you get your way, you're happy. I don't think she actually knows what that means. I cannot believe that she pressured him to move here. And then the day after he finally does, she's telling him that she expects him to propose within the next three months. I'm, I'm sorry, I, no, I would leave, I would leave. Absolutely no shame to people who have these expectations. The reason why I'm so surprised is because Megan does have these expectations of a person like John. John clearly is not comfortable with the timeline that she is moving on. So the fact that she was even able to get him to make the decision to move out to her, I would hope that she would at least give him like a week before having the discussion of him proposing to her. Like, can your daughter know him for like, a full 24 hours before you bring this up? I mean, it seems like, you know, a little fast. Oh, yeah. Is she actually surprised that he thinks that this is fast? John goes on to say that, yes, he does think it's fast. And Megan looks at him super skeptical and just says, But you've done it before. And it was a mistake. So I, I wouldn't want to make another rush decision. Dude, red flag. That is a red flag for me. Don't be out here looking at him with disdain saying, you know, you asked this other girl to marry you in a short time span. So if you're not willing to ask me, it clearly must mean that you don't love me enough. Like girl, are they still together? Like clearly the speed at which he asks someone to marry him is no indication of the future success of the relationship. So let him breathe for a second. Megan is clearly upset, disappointed, sad, whatever. And John says he loves her and she does not care. Now let's head down to Miami to meet up with Debbie. Last episode, Debbie introduced Julian to Ruben and Julian proceeded to basically sabotage her by revealing how she dated a 24 year old, how she moved to Morocco for him and how she's still sending money back to his family. Can you say cop blocker? The graffiti class is over and Debbie and Ruben head out to grab some mojitos, which is great because both of them will probably need some of that liquid courage. Ruben is very level headed about this whole thing. And he tells us that he does not know if Julian was trying to sabotage their relationship, but regardless of his intention, what he said did raise some doubts in Ruben's mind and he wants to clear up any potential misunderstandings so that they can move forward in a direction that is right for both of them, even if that means going their separate ways. 
Ruben gets right to the point. He talked to me about your past relationship. He brought that up. Moved to Morocco for someone. And then he... Ruben says that Julian mentioned her last relationship caused a lot of turmoil for her family, and it has him concerned. Debbie is definitely surprised and clearly upset that Julian revealed something that is very embarrassing for her and something that she's quite ashamed of. She tries to explain it to Ruben as best as she can. It was no impulsive decision. I had known this gentleman for several years. I know that she's saying this, trying to show him that it wasn't like this reckless decision, but all this screams to me is that you started dating him when he was 20. And I just don't think that it serves as the defense that you think it does. Debbie says that she moved with the intention of marriage and it was Osama who backed out. Ruben, I gotta say, is showing so much empathy and kindness. You know, and I can understand you wanting to chase, you know, love. You know, I do have concerns with that bridge, Lon Burn. There's no romantic future for Osama and myself. He also brings up that Julian mentioned that she still has ties to her ex and he knows that she has a big heart and that he thinks that she's probably still helping them out. I love how Ruben didn't try to trap Debbie in a lie and he also kept from throwing Julian under the bus. He instead gave Debbie a clear way to be open to telling him the truth. Ruben reassures Debbie that he wants to keep getting to know her and he's glad that they were able to clear things up. I'm gonna take what she told me, that it's over on face value. Of course, I'm gonna have what Julian told me in the back of my mind, but I'll be constantly optimistic. Debbie is happy that Ruben and her were able to talk things through, but she is definitely disappointed in Julian. I think Julian planted seeds of doubt. Maybe he's thinking, proceed with caution with me. Ruben doesn't deserve that. He doesn't deserve to start a relationship in so much doubt. Like he's such a cinnamon bun of a man. Let's head on over to Los Angeles to see what our princess Natalie is up to. Last episode, Natalie and her mother went to a fertility clinic to see what her options were with conceiving without a partner. And after reviewing some of the donors they had to offer, Natalie decides that she does wanna have a child, but she wants to have one with someone she loves and someone who loves her back. It is a new day and Natalie's mother is cooking breakfast, which is Eggos in a saucepan. Oh my God. You couldn't squeeze out a toaster from Josh before breaking up with him? It has been one month since the breakup and Natalie is not doing great. I'm single, 38, in LA, alone, with no job, with mom. I can't believe that it's been a month of her being in LA and she still does not have a job. How is she affording to like stay alive? I mean, I guess that explains the egos in the saucepan. Yeah, including her into her next life if you keep feeding her egos with like a pound of powdered sugar. Are you trying to put her in a sugar induced coma? My God. Natalie is super sad because now she has to start dating all over again and find another man to try and fix her. All my dreams just feel kind of disappear at one time because I had a plan with Josh. Now I don't have a plan. What do you mean you don't have a plan now? Girl, you didn't have a plan before. Natalie's mother tells her that she actually reached out to Michael and invited him over, which Natalie isn't super pleased about at first. Natalie tells her that she had such high expectations for her life with Josh when she moved out to LA, which obviously those were crushed. And instead of taking this time to heal and learn how to be okay on her own, she hopes that Michael will re-enter her life and basically fix all of her problems. I, I like, I have a lot of mixed feelings, but on the other hand, I hope Michael will bring some light into my life. Natalie's mom is like, oh my God, Michael is so great. He's so supportive. And Natalie's like, mother, he does not want me. He probably wants nothing to do with me. And her mom is like, I don't know. He loved you before. I mean, who knows? Maybe he's never stopped loving you. Maybe he loves you now. And Natalie's like, mm, I don't know, but he said he was coming. And her mom is like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so get dressed, get ready to make up so that you can give me some grandbabies. Потому что может быть будет лучше, может быть мы договоримся. Может быть лучше и и всегда. Но у нас будут еще дети. I need them to put this whole baby thing on the back burner. Natalie needs to get her shit together first. Maybe instead of a baby, she should focus on like getting a job. 
what are you going to do if you have a kid? Are you going to feed it Eggos and powdered sugar every morning too? Natalie starts to get excited and she tells us that even though Michael and her have not spoken in a year, she thinks that they could make a happy family. I still have some feelings for Mike and I think like he might have some feelings for me too. It is a rainy day and Natalie and her mother go to the local farmer's market to meet up with Michael. I'm excited and I'm nervous. I had to go through the whole Jewish experience, but getting back together with Mike wouldn't be as easy as mom would think. Natalie tells her mom that she's super nervous and she just never expected to be in this position again. Her mother says that she really wants her to be with Michael and to have a family and just be happy. Natalie agrees and her mother tells her not to worry and just focus on reestablishing their relationship. Can we get Natalie's mother like a puppy or a fish or a plant, like just something that she can take care of? Her mom is focusing on getting grandbabies way more than Natalie's actual happiness. I get that Natalie does want to be a mother, but you know how when you're in the airplane and they tell you if shit goes south, put the oxygen mask on you before helping anyone else? You have to make sure you're good before you think about caring for someone else. Michael arrives and everyone hugs it out. Natalie and Mike hug for what seems like an eternity. I mean, it definitely looks like Michael feels like it is an eternity. Natalie takes off her rose-colored glasses and proceeds to just embed those lenses straight into her eyeballs. Michael, show sure, how brain stop. He's here, he's tall and handsome. And I feel like anything is possible. Michael tells us that he's so happy to be able to see Natalie and her mother. And of course, he still has love in his heart for both of them. They sit down to eat some lunch and catch up. Natalie's mom says that she's been loving LA and that the people here are kind. And Natalie goes on to say that they live a pretty modest life. Yeah, no duh, you have no income. It's just so funny because I came to America for you. I mean, what ultimately drove you here to LA? Natalie goes on to say she moved here for Josh, but they broke up and he's no longer a part of her life. It's uh, just time to um, make up. <laughs> Natalie's mom asks that they drop her off at home so that the two of them can be alone and reconcile. Honestly, this could be my moment to save my marriage. I mean, life is miracle. I believe in miracles. <laughs> Natalie is Looney Tunes. Gather around for a little story time, my panda pals. Natalie reminds me so much of this one person I used to know when I was in college. She was also coincidentally an aspiring actress and a uh, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. So this girl, let's call her Amy. She was also going back and forth between two guys. Uh, let's call them Jack and Tom. So Jack was absolutely in love with her and tried to get with her, but Amy kept friend zoning him because she wanted to get with Tom. Amy and Tom finally start dating, but she always kept Jack on a very short leash. So anytime Tom did not give her the affection or response that she was looking for, she would basically then tap into Jack and get it from him. One day, Jack just had enough of being played with. And so he made the decision to move on from her. And so he started dating and seeing other people. When Amy found out he was talking to other girls romantically, she went bananas. All of a sudden, Amy drives to her boyfriend's house, breaks up with him, and then gets in her car to immediately drive to go see Jack, tries to call him. He doesn't pick up. She tries to call him like 20, 30 times. He finally answers and he's like, please leave me alone. And she starts screaming and crying. And she's like, I broke up with my boyfriend for you. I want to be with you. I love you. I've always loved you. Isn't this what you wanted to hear forever? You can finally be with me. Let's be together. Which is cuckoo behavior. And that is basically Natalie. She isn't actually in love with these guys. She's in love with being loved. Anyway, moving on to Veronica. Last episode, Jamal and Veronica get into a pretty heated argument about her relationship with Tim. Jamal acts like a big condescending baby and is confused when Veronica gets upset at him. It is the next morning and Veronica reflects on her behavior the night before. He saw me at my ugliest last night. 
I lost it and I'm really disappointed in a lot of the things I said. Jamal comes in and he says that instead of going to the hotel last night, he was able to sit down with Veronica and they were able to talk things out and apologize to each other. Um, we both apologized to each other. I think we both said things we probably shouldn't have said. I mean, I don't really recall Veronica saying anything she shouldn't have. The pair sit down and Jamal tells her that he feels like he triggered her last night because he's been pressing her about her relationship with Tim more and more. Veronica agrees and says that she was honestly surprised because she really did not think he would have an issue with Tim. I don't know why you would think that. Because I just, because I thought a person who's like super secure and confident is not gonna have an issue with Tim. Like Tim's not a threat to anybody. Veronica goes on to commend Jamal and say that the way he handled everything from this trip to his conflict with Tim to her meltdown the night before, she just really appreciates him putting up with it. Listen, Jamal is speaking in a calm and collected manner and it's not in a condescending way, which is great. I just hate how this feels like Veronica is just saying, I'm so grateful you could deal with my meltdown. And it just takes away any need for Jamal to bear any responsibility for his part in this argument. Like Veronica, why did you even have the meltdown? Jamal also melted down that night and you don't see him owning up and apologizing for it and then thanking Veronica for dealing with his inability to communicate his feelings effectively. Couples fight all the time. The bigger thing is when you have conflict because conflict will come up, how do you resolve that conflict? She's not wrong, but so far it feels like their conflict is resolved because Veronica shouldered all the blame. Because she keeps saying things like she was so irrational, she was so out of line when really she wasn't. She was just a normal amount of mad. Anyway, I realize that I can't be here saying that I'm gonna give John the opportunity to try to grow into a better person and not do the same for Jamal. So I will give him the benefit of the doubt. Jamal does make this easier to do by telling Veronica that he will keep working on communicating better and even brings up the possibility of moving out to Charlotte. Um, what? Shouldn't I have said that? No, I'm just shocked I haven't scared you off yet. Jamal reflects and says a lot of reassuring and introspective things. Whether I like Charlotte or not, I do know I wanna be around Veronica. I need to stop saying if, you know, cause I do want her to know like I am intentional going forward. Hopefully this trajectory of growth continues. Veronica drops Jamal off at the airport and both of them mark this trip as a success. I have never felt more secure and safe and taken care of and seen and that's huge. And with that, my Panda Pals, we have arrived to the end of this recap. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you had a blast. I hope to see you again next time. And as always, thanks for not letting me ride this train wreck alone. Bye.